Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.2, A Survey of European Politics in the 16th Century. Over the next several episodes, we are going to delve into the world of Europe during the 16th century and set the scene for the conditions in Europe on the eve of the Jamestown colony. So before we start today, I want to give you a roadmap of where we are going over the next couple weeks as we prepare to cross the Atlantic in 1607. This week, we are going to begin by looking at the different powers in Europe and what they are doing during the 1500s. We're going to focus primarily on the activities going on in England during this time, as they are going to be the most central power to our story throughout the first season. However, even with our focus placed primarily on England, we should be able to get a sense of what the rest of the major European powers were doing during this period. In two weeks, we will have an episode looking at what many consider the definitive battle of the era, the English defeat of the Spanish Armada. This battle is often portrayed as the event that launched England as an imperial power. Following the Spanish Armada, we will turn our attention to the question of religion during the era. Religion is at the heart of everything in the 1500s and is going to be especially important when we reach the foundation of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Religion during this era is dominated by the Reformation. Likewise, we are going to look at the effects of Henry VIII in creating the Church of England and see what effects that that had. We will conclude our survey of Europe by looking at the economic state of the continent during the 16th century. We will look at how the economic changes in Europe fueled the great powers to look across the Atlantic and begin to gobble up land. Finally, we will take a tour of the Americas at the start of the 17th century and look at who is where throughout the New World and what they were doing. With all that behind us, and the scene adequately set, we can finally get ready to cross the Atlantic and begin looking at the English efforts to enter into the colonization game. This should give you a basic outline of the next several episodes of the podcast and provide an idea of where I'm planning on taking the story. Finally, before we get started today, I want to make a note about the length of the upcoming episodes. I plan to do my very best to keep every episode at around a half an hour. However, in these early episodes, we are going to be looking at sweeping surveys of the European landscape. I want to get through these episodes as quickly as possible so we can start getting on to our main story, and I don't really want to start breaking these up into multiple parts. So, for the next several episodes, I do expect we are going to be going longer than the half hour that I plan to stick to in the future. Sorry about that. For this week, we are going to begin by taking a survey of European politics, specifically in regards to England during the 16th century. Now, as I said at the beginning of my last episode, I really only mean to give this to you as an idea of who all the major players were and the events that shaped the world that brought people across the Atlantic. Seriously, Henry VIII and Elizabeth are hugely important figures in modern European history. Each one of them deserves more than the few minutes that I plan to spend on them in this episode. By the end of today, I'm hoping that you have a basic sense of what's going on with the major powers in Europe during the 16th century and immediately prior to the English colonies in the New World. So why cover the political situation in Europe prior to the first colonies anyway? I think it is always important when looking at history to try to keep in mind what the people at the time must have been thinking. To them, none of this was ancient history. In England, Elizabeth and Henry VIII were recent. The first colony in Jamestown was founded in 1607. The reign of Elizabeth I ended with her death in 1603. This podcast was originally posted in 2018. By comparison, if we were doing the podcast about politics in the United States today, we would only be going back to the presidency of Barack Obama. Henry VIII, his reign ended in 1547, only 60 years prior to Jamestown. That would be like talking about the Eisenhower presidency. While the people headed to Jamestown may not remember Henry VIII, their parents did, and they were certainly born into a world that was colored by his reign. And beyond that, the 16th century would prove a critical linchpin in Europe when it comes to explaining the reasons why colonization suddenly proliferated. This will be especially expressed when we cover the religious matters and the rising importance of the economy. The 16th century in many ways is an era that sees vast changes throughout Europe. The Middle Ages are quickly moving into the rearview mirror and the Renaissance is spreading throughout the continent, and we are entering into the beginning of the modern age. We see England go from the tumultuous reign of Henry VIII into the prosperity of the Elizabethan era. The Spanish and Portuguese would reach high points in their empires during this century, 
before coming together to form the Iberian Union in the later half of the 16th century. The mighty Holy Roman Empire will enter into a long period of decline during this century. The Dutch enter into an age of prosperity that would last for nearly 200 years and see them grow to become one of the big European powers. However, they are going to have to endure a fairly brutal war first that we'll talk about more later. And France, much like the rest of Europe, is going to struggle under the new religious realities of the Reformation. But at the same time, at the end of the 16th century, House Bourbon would rise to power, a position that they're going to hold, on and off, all the way up until 1848. To begin the tour, let's start by looking at England during the 16th century. And there are two primary figures that define the 1500s for England, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Henry VIII will control the first half of the century, ruling England from 1509 until his death in 1547. Henry VIII's biggest legacy is going to be his relationship with the Catholic Church and the creation of the Church of England. And while this is going to have huge political consequences, it is a topic that I'm planning on saving, partially at least, until our episode on the changing religious landscapes of Europe. So don't despair if it seems like I'm missing out on a huge part of Henry VIII. I promise you it is coming. Henry VIII was born on June 28, 1491. As the third child and second son of King Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, young Henry had a privileged upbringing. Henry was the second son of the family, so initially, his hope to inherit the English crown was hindered by his brother Arthur. But Arthur would never make it to the throne, dying of the sweating sickness at age 15. What is sweating sickness, you ask? Well, the sources are scarce with what it actually was. However, there is some indication that it might have been some kind of a hantavirus. Regardless, however, of what sweating sickness actually is, with the death of his brother, Henry moved into a position to become the next king of England. Shortly before his death, Arthur had married Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of Ferdinand II and Isabella of Spain. Following his death, Henry VIII quickly realized the importance of an alliance with the Spanish. Despite some early reservations about the marriage, which we are going to talk more about here in the subsequent episode on religion, Henry VIII decided to move forward and marry Catherine for himself. Spain during this time was a rapidly growing empire, and maintaining a good relationship with the Spanish crown was key. This is especially true, as the Spanish acted as a check against French aggression to the east. An alliance with the Spanish crown, therefore, could provide the English with a degree of protection. Henry VIII came to power in 1509 at the age of 17. Not wasting much time, Henry wed Catherine of Aragon and began the process of purging people from his father's court. When speaking of Henry VIII, there are generally two topics that quickly come to mind. The first being his reforms to the church, and the second being his six wives. As to the church, we're going to largely ignore that in this episode and cover it more in our episode on the religious situation in Europe during the 16th century. So that leaves us with his marriages. While there are numerous books and other sources written about the wives of Henry VIII, we are going to focus specifically on three women, Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, and Jane Seymour. Why just these three? The primary reason for this is, this episode is only really meant to give you a basic idea of what was going on in England right before the formation of the new colonies. The three women mentioned above are going to have the biggest impact over the politics in England, and will do the most to explain a changing political and religious landscape. With that, I give my deepest apologies to Anne of Cleves, Catherine of Howard, and Catherine Parr. While we may not cover you in this podcast, you are not forgotten. Following his marriage in 1509, Henry VIII recognized the need to secure a clear and uncontested line of succession. This means that he required a son. This becomes a problem, however, for Catherine of Aragon and Henry. Catherine suffered a stillbirth for the couple's first child, a daughter. While she would give birth to a son during her second pregnancy, named Henry Tudor, he too would die while still an infant. Catherine would then suffer through another two stillbirths before giving birth in 1516 to a daughter named Mary. It was a well-known thing throughout the court of Henry that he regularly took mistresses. Amongst these mistresses was Mary Boleyn. At around the same time, it appears that Catherine may have been entering the early stages of menopause, making it appear all but impossible that she would birth a son. This creates a crisis for Henry VIII. Without a clear line of succession, his family's dynasty came into question. 
Henry, it appears, had also become interested in the sister of Mary Boleyn, Anne. Anne Boleyn was very hesitant to become mistress to the king for various reasons. By all accounts, she had been close with Catherine and disapproved of Henry's treatment of his mistresses. With a potential succession crisis looming, and Catherine looking less and less likely to produce a son, Henry was essentially left with three choices. He could cross his fingers and hope that Mary has a male heir in time. He did have an illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, that he could legitimize. Or he could end the marriage to Catherine and remarry. The best decision for Henry was to have an heir of his own body and not to have questions regarding the legitimacy of his son. That makes legitimizing Henry Fitzroy a poor decision. Likewise, there was a concern that Henry would die before Mary was old enough to have a male heir. Therefore, the decision was made. Henry VIII would leave Catherine of Aragon and would marry Anne Boleyn. It is this decision to leave Catherine and marry Anne that would ultimately cause the English Reformation. When the Pope denied an annulment of the marriage between Catherine and Henry, Henry rejected papal authority and founded the Church of England. Of course, this is a hugely important topic, and again, we are going to cover it more in depth when we deal with religious matters. For this week, however, just know that Henry VIII did manage to bring his marriage to Catherine of Aragon to an end, and subsequently married Anne Boleyn. The date of the marriage to Anne is the subject of some debate, however, it does appear that it happened at the end of 1532. This would correspond with Anne discovering that she was pregnant. And while some sources do show the date of the marriage as November 1532, prior to the discovery of the pregnancy, it does actually appear more likely that the two married in early spring 1533, potentially even before the end of the marriage between Henry and Catherine. Regardless, with the marriage between Catherine and Henry officially over, in September of 1533, Anne gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. This, of course, failed to solve the problem that Henry VIII had in regards to his succession. Anne would soon become pregnant again, however, lost the baby during the pregnancy, once again denying Henry the heir that he so desperately desired. Around the same time, Anne learned that Henry had once again begun taking mistresses, a practice that she continued to disapprove of. Despite several other attempts, Anne Boleyn never managed to produce a son for Henry. During the same period, in terms of foreign policy, the reign of Henry VIII was defined by conflict with France and Spain. Francis I of France had hoped to establish a good relationship with the king. However, deep divides between the French and the English existed. Namely, religion continues to be a major problem. The French remained a Catholic state and strongly disapproved of Anne Boleyn and her heretical beliefs. During a meeting with Henry around this time, Francis I had attempted to create an alliance with him by offering the French prince in marriage to Mary I, completely ignoring Elizabeth. While Mary was the older daughter, by this point Henry had stripped her of her title of princess and bestowed the title to Elizabeth. In regards to the Spanish, Henry's decision to leave Catherine caused not only great turmoil in the church, but a deep rift between the Spanish crown and Charles V, who was at that time both King of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor. The rift would remain one of the biggest foreign challenges for Henry, as Charles V continually refused to accept Anne Boleyn as the rightful queen. During a meeting with Henry in 1536, an ambassador for Charles V made the position of the emperor clear. The position was a complete denial to recognize Anne as the rightful queen. Henry, furious by the snub, demanded that Charles V acknowledge Anne as the queen in writing, something that Charles V was never going to do. Recognizing the magnitude of the problem, Henry's chief minister, Charles Cromwell, understood that it was really time that Anne go. Shortly following the incident between Henry and the ambassador for Charles V, Cromwell convened a special commission to investigate Anne Boleyn and her closest allies for treason and adultery. Cromwell presented the evidence to Henry that Anne had committed treason with several people, including her brother, George Boleyn. Cromwell claimed that the plot had been to kill Henry and rule England through a regency, as Anne was pregnant at that time. Henry, understandably furious over the findings, and still not thrilled that he did not have a son, ordered the execution of Anne. In one swift move, Cromwell had managed to purge the entire Boleyn faction out of Henry's court. On May 19, 1536, Anne Boleyn was executed outside the Tower of London, 
Henry also took this occasion to claim that Elizabeth was, as Mary was found to be years before, illegitimate. Before the execution of Anne Boleyn, Henry had already begun an affair with Jane Seymour. Seymour was popular around court and, months before the fall of Anne, was moved into the royal household by Henry, largely with the help of Thomas Cromwell. Wanting to waste no time, Henry married Jane Seymour just one day after the execution of Anne Boleyn. Henry by this point was getting older and the reality of a crisis in succession was becoming an increasingly big concern. This becomes even more problematic when in June of 1536, Henry's illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, died of what appears to have been tuberculosis. Suddenly, the options for Henry VIII and his succession became even more limited. Now, there wasn't even an illegitimate heir that could be named his successor. Luckily for Henry, Jane Seymour would produce the son that Henry needed. In 1537, the future king, Edward VI, was born. While the birth of a male heir was celebrated, it also came with heartbreak for Henry. Jane Seymour became ill shortly after his birth and two weeks later would die. Henry would go on to marry three more times. However, those are all going to fall outside the scope of this episode. In 1544, the question of succession would come up one final time. While preparing for a war with France, Henry became concerned over the fact that his only heir was the often sickly Edward. Henry brought both Mary and Elizabeth back into the fold as full heirs. This would ultimately prove to be a critical decision for the future of England. The problem between the French and the English at this point came from an alliance Henry had made with Charles V back in 1539. Following the death of Anne, much of the animosity between the two men had abated. Henry had agreed to step in and ally with Charles during an ongoing war in Italy. Henry had agreed to invade France as part of the Italian campaign, but before doing so, he needed to deal with the matters in Scotland first. Following the sound defeat of Scottish King James V, resulting in his death, Henry had hoped to marry Mary, Queen of Scots, to his son, Edward, and unite the English and Scottish crown. This is something that the Scottish Parliament balked at, and something which Henry would never actually accomplish. After delaying as long as he could, in June of 1544, nearly two years after agreeing to join the Italian campaign and under a threat of French invasion himself, Henry launched his attack. Despite some early successes in Boulogne, the campaign for both sides quickly turned sour. Following a separate peace with France and by Charles V, Henry moved to quickly conclude the war with France. With both nations not wishing to drain their treasuries more and continue to pursue the war, a peace was soon reached. In January of 1547, Henry VIII died. His son Edward VI would succeed him. However, as discussed a few moments ago, Edward had often been a sickly child. In 1553, Edward VI would also die. At the time of his death, the young Edward had no children. That meant that the English crown passed into the hands of Mary, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. When the crown passed to Mary, the most pressing issue again turned to the question of religion. Despite England embracing the Reformation, Mary remained a devout Catholic, much like her mother had been. Much like her father, Mary knew she needed to produce a male heir. She sought as her job to steer the nation back towards the church and in that pursuit reversed many of the laws that her father had passed. Her nickname, Bloody Mary, is in reference to the purges of the Protestants that would be carried out under her reign. Mary by this point was aware that should she die without a male heir, England would pass back to her Protestant sister Elizabeth. With that in mind, Mary agreed to marry the Prince of Spain, Philip II. Knowing that there would be resistance from her subjects should she marry a foreign king, Mary proclaimed Philip II would only have rights to the English crown so long as she lived. Mary outlined that Philip would be referred to in all official documents as the King of England only up until her death. The purpose for doing this was to stop fears of a Spanish takeover. Without these protections, should an accident have befallen Mary, Spain, for all intents and purposes, would have taken over England something that both Parliament and the people were strongly opposed to. For what it's worth, it appears that Philip II hated his time in England. He was constantly treated as a foreigner, found that he didn't actually care for Mary at all, and really wanted just to return home. 
The benefit of the marriage to him was that his son would eventually become the King of England, which at the time was enough to keep him around. But Mary never would have that child, despite believing that she had become pregnant in September of 1554. The first sign that something was wrong came in early spring of 1555 when Mary failed to give birth. As more and more time went on, it became clear that Mary wasn't in fact pregnant. A repeat of this came a couple years later in 1557, and like the first time, the pregnancy also proved to be false. Unlike the first time, however, Mary would not recover. In November of 1558, Queen Mary, the first female queen in England's history, died. Today, it is believed that the cause of death was likely some kind of ovarian or stomach cancer. Upon the death of Mary, several things quickly happened. First and foremost, Elizabeth came to power. At the same time, Philip II lost any claim to the English throne that he had had. But let's not completely let Philip II out of our story yet. He will be back in a big way. So Philip, you can just go stand over in the corner for right now. Now, there was a potential second option in terms of the succession. The Catholic Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scotland. Mary was born on December 8, 1542. Mary Stuart's grandmother was Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry VIII. It is through this that Mary had her own claim on the English throne. There was a saying during Roman times of being born into the purple, a phrase that means a child, from the moment they were born, were in a position to inherit the empire. Mary Stuart takes this to the next level. Just six days after she was born, the King of Scotland, James V, dies. Mary, his only surviving child, became Queen of Scotland in her first week of life. The thought that Mary I had originally had was that should she and her child die during childbirth, Mary could go ahead and exclude her Protestant sister Elizabeth. This would ensure that the move back to the church that Mary had worked so hard on establishing would not be undone through Elizabeth. There was a problem with this, however. Mary Stuart was engaged to Francis II, the heir to the French throne. Therefore, had the crown passed to Mary Stuart, it would have established England as a French dominion. For Philip II, this was unacceptable, as Spain and France were currently at war. With Mary out, this left only one option, Elizabeth. Philip II, not wanting to give up his claims in England, did at one point propose a marriage with Elizabeth. This, of course, brought several problems with it, the main one again being religion. Whereas Mary was the devoutly Catholic daughter of Catherine, Elizabeth was the Protestant daughter of Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth showed little interest in marrying Philip II. While Philip did maintain a good relationship with the English crown initially, things would eventually turn south between Elizabeth and Philip. This accumulates in an attempted invasion of England by Spain and the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Before we get there, however, let's step back and get to know Elizabeth. Coming to power following the death of Mary I, Elizabeth immediately stepped into dangerous waters. The first problem for the young queen was a question of legitimacy. Many of the Catholics in England viewed the marriage between Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn as illegitimate. The Pope never did grant an annulment, and they were not about to accept Boleyn as their queen. Time did not change those sediments. They did not view Anne as their queen, and therefore did not view her daughter Elizabeth as a legitimate heir to the English throne. Elizabeth rightfully worried that Catholic conspirators would seek to remove her from power and replace her with the Catholic Mary Stuart. Elizabeth acted promptly and moved in an unexpected way. While the official state religion was going to remain Protestant, Elizabeth instilled a sense of religious tolerance. This tolerance largely did its job and quickly put to bed any questions of civil war in England. Nobody wished to return to the purchase that had occurred under her sister Mary. While Catholics still had their complaints and feelings regarding Elizabeth's legitimacy, the tolerance that she provided kept everybody from acting brashly. Catholics were able to continue a practicing without fear of violent reprisal from the crown. While Elizabeth herself was a proclaimed Protestant, she continued to keep many Catholic symbols around her, such as the crucifix. Where Elizabeth does bristle towards religion came from a group known as the Puritans. The Puritans' goal was to purify the Church of England. This group wanted to purge the Church from all Catholic influence. 
This was far more than Elizabeth was willing to accept, and she went to great lengths to put checks upon the Puritans. In her religious settlements of 1559, Elizabeth placed numerous rules to limit the effect the Puritans could have over her church. Now, that's all I'm going to say about the Puritans in this episode. However, they're going to be back in a very big way down the road. We are going to take much more time and look much more closely at the Puritans and what they stand for, both in our episode on religion and, again, in much more depth before they board the Mayflower to head to Massachusetts. Following her rejection of marriage to Philip II, Elizabeth's advisors were upset over the lost opportunity to make an alliance with the powerful Habsburg Empire. Throughout everything, religion remains a powerful motivation for Philip. Philip was hoping that had he married Elizabeth, he would be able to bring England back into the Catholic fold. For her part, Elizabeth proved hesitant to marry. Beyond speculation in the sources, there does not appear to be a definitive explanation for why she made the decision never to get married. Proposed theories on the subject of why Elizabeth never married range from her being unable to have children to her being generally distasteful of the institution of marriage following her father's treatment of his wives. Of course, in the case of Philip, it is entirely possible that the rejection by Elizabeth was just as motivated by religion as was Philip's initial proposal. If Philip wanted to marry Elizabeth to return England to the church, it would not be surprising that Elizabeth would resist the marriage and ensure that England remained Protestant. Upon the final rejection of Philip II by Elizabeth, relations between England and Spain quickly began to cool. A major concern was the Netherlands. Spain was in control of the Netherlands, where William I was leading a Protestant revolt against the Catholic Spanish forces. Philip sent troops to put down the insurrection, placing a garrison in Brussels. This proved to be a check on English aggression, keeping them out of the fight, but at the same time, it did push Elizabeth to begin improving the English navy, something that would prove very important in the future. Elizabeth was also having to deal with internal threats to her power, namely Mary Stuart. In the eyes of many Catholics, Mary did have the more legitimate claim to the throne than did Elizabeth. Again, many Catholics never did recognize the divorce between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Therefore, the marriage between Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn was illegal, hence the claim by Elizabeth was illegitimate. Mary had found herself facing her own problems in Scotland, which led to her arrest in 1567. Without going into overwhelming detail, the entire situation surrounded the mysterious death of Mary's husband, Lord Darnley. If you're listening and saying, hey, wasn't Mary Stuart married to Francis II? Well, yes, yes she was, for a short time. However, in 1560, Francis II died of a brain abscess, probably as the result of an ear infection. Be happy for antibiotics. In the case of Lord Darnley, accusations flew towards Mary that she was somehow connected to his murder. At the same time, Lord Bothwell of Scotland was seeking a marriage with Mary. Bothwell had been the primary suspect in the murder of Mary's husband and now had essentially kidnapped Mary and, possibly, forced her into a marriage with him. This marriage proved very unpopular with the Scottish people for numerous reasons. On one level, it rubbed the population the wrong way that Mary should get married to the man who had been suspected of killing her husband. More problematically, however, is that Bothwell was a Protestant. With tensions rising, 26 Scottish lords raised an army and marched against Mary. While a battle was ultimately avoided, the end result saw Bothwell given safe passage off the field and out of the country, where he eventually ended up in Norway. Mary was arrested and forced to abdicate her throne. Escaping from her imprisonment in 1568, Mary made her way to Elizabeth and asked for protection. This was a delicate matter for Elizabeth. In the eyes of many, Mary has the better claim to the English crown, not to mention that the Spanish crown wanted to restore Catholicism in England. They currently had a garrison dangerously close in Brussels. Counselors around Elizabeth encouraged her to return Mary to Scotland in what would have been an almost sure execution. Elizabeth, however, decides to go with a different direction agreeing to spare Mary's life and provide her with protection in exchange for Mary rejecting all claims to the English crown, something that Mary had previously been unwilling to do. In 
Elizabeth likely worried about the precedent allowing Mary to be executed would set for herself. For these reasons, she does agree to help spare her life. Despite this, however, Mary would continue to hesitate to relinquish claims to the English crown. Mary would remain a thorn in the side of Elizabeth for much of her reign. Following Elizabeth's intervention to spare Mary, the casket letters were published. These letters, though very possibly complete forgeries, were intended to prove that Mary was complicit in her husband's death, something that Mary would always continue to deny. Elizabeth also had to continue to deal with the problem that Mary posed to her own reign. At one point down the road, Elizabeth was actually negotiating with the Scottish regents to take Mary back and allow her to be tried for the murder of her husband, something that the Scottish have appeared now to lost interest in. As it turns out, killing their queen was a much less appealing option than just leaving her in England as Elizabeth's problem. For Mary's part, she had also come to realize that her chances at regaining the Scottish crown were gone. For her, it made much more sense to place her sights on the English crown. There was already a strong base in place, with the Catholics in England viewing her as the better heir anyway. In 1570, Pope Pius V would throw some extra gasoline on the fire when he excommunicates Elizabeth. The Pope would go a step further, absolving Catholics in England of their allegiance to Elizabeth. Plus, goes even further than that, stating that any who choose to continue to follow her laws themselves would be considered heretics. This all ends up reaching ahead in 1571 with the Rodolfi Plan. The plan had been designed by Roberto Rodolfi, an international banker and, more importantly, a strong Catholic, who felt as though he needed to step in and help bring Catholicism back to England. The plan was to have the Spanish Duke of Alba invade from the Netherlands, depose Elizabeth, and then to have Mary get married to Thomas Howard, the then Duke of Norfolk. The hope was that the Catholics inside of England would quickly rally to the cause. This plan ultimately fails when it's discovered by those around Elizabeth. While she would spare the life of Mary, she did execute Thomas Howard for his involvement. It is also interesting to note that among those with knowledge of this plan, were our good friends Pope Pius V, who had just excommunicated Elizabeth, and Philip II. Mary would continue to plot and scheme against Elizabeth. Finally, following the Babington plot in 1586, which would have seen Elizabeth assassinated and Mary made queen, Elizabeth had had enough. With undisputable evidence in the form of a letter penned by Mary that showed her involvement in the planning, Elizabeth was left with no choice. Mary Stuart was tried, convicted, and beheaded for her role in the plot. Mary Stuart dies on February 8, 1587. While internal conflict and the threat to her crown was always a major issue for Elizabeth, there was also the issue of rising tensions between the English and the Spanish over English involvement in the Netherlands. Tensions had been steadily increasing from the time that Elizabeth declined to marry Philip II, and this had gotten more so during the late 1570s. Tension reached a high point in 1584, when Philip decided to offer support to the Catholic League in France. Elizabeth undoubtedly feared an alliance between the Spanish and the French, and knew that she had to react. The reaction of Elizabeth came in the form of the Treaty of Nonsuch, whereby she would support the Dutch cause against the Spanish. The treaty would provide the Dutch with support, both financial and in terms of actual troops, in exchange for two seats on the Netherlands Council of State. This ultimately leads to a war between the English and Spanish. It is during this war that the English would score a victory against the Spanish Armada, an event that is often credited at changing the balance of power in Europe. For this week, All you need to know is that the English repulsed Philip II and defeated the Armada. As for the details, I will cover those next week when we look at the defeat of the Armada in much more depth. During the later part of her reign, Elizabeth became increasingly less tolerant of religion, likely influenced by the repeated attempts to overthrow her by Mary Stuart and Philip II. Despite that, however, the Elizabethan era is looked on fondly today in English history. English culture had taken leaps forward during this period as people like Shakespeare emerged on the scene. Following the Spanish Armada, the English emerge as a new naval power. It was under Elizabeth that the first English colony in the future United States would be established in Roanoke, 
something that we will discuss in detail in a future episode. Finally, Elizabeth stands in stark contrast to her sister Mary I. Elizabeth always struggled with the use of capital punishment. Many monarchs throughout history would have had Mary Stuart executed simply for having any legitimate claim to the crown. Yet, Elizabeth doesn't. Even after multiple plots against her own life, Elizabeth still was reluctant to execute Mary. It wasn't until the Babington plot, where there was irrefutable evidence of Mary's actions, that Elizabeth was left with no choice. Mary I has become known to history as Bloody Mary, for the often violent suppression of the Protestants. Elizabeth couldn't be any further from this, a decision that on many occasions nearly cost her her life. On March 24, 1603, Elizabeth dies. Along with Elizabeth died the Tudor dynasty that had ruled England for a century. Elizabeth had failed to name an heir and died childless. At that time, James VI, King of Scotland, had the best claim and would become King James I of England. Under James I, the crowns of the British Isles were united. James I would title himself King of Great Britain and Ireland. We will talk much more about James I, as he will be the monarch under which England would begin its journey to colonize the Americas. In two weeks' time, we will resume the narrative and explore the defeat of the Spanish Armada, often looked at as one of the most important naval battles in both English and European history. Until then, I appreciate you listening and encourage you to send me your thoughts and feedback. Positive iTunes reviews are also much appreciated. With that, I will see you all in two weeks' time, and we will look at the Armada. Thank you. Thank you.